How we treat women and girls is absolutely essential to who we are as a people. The issue of gender equality globally must be addressed if the problems that we share across the world are to be solved. It's the way that we can bring greater peace and balance in this world. We're at the point of freedom. And that means two things. One is it's maximum danger, and the other is we're not going to stop. What Nick and Cheryl have been able to do is tell very compelling stories of people that they empathize with and understand in their context. Well, I, I got an email. I remember like the subject being like Sierra Leone, and I opened that one because I was like, well, that's interesting. What's that all about? And then it was the invitation to come on board, and I immediately said yes. I love what Nick and Cheryl say in the book, that women are not the problem, they're the solution. When I, I started reading what Half the Sky is about, and what the message is, and the story. You are so beautiful and so smart. I know you'll be very successful. You can't say no. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't ask, but can I ask, did your husband ever hit you? No. But so because I'm very harsh. <laughs> Nick and Cheryl kind of revolutionized the way people talk about aid and made people very fired up and inspired and certainly made me want to get out there and be a part of the movement. So you were a commercial sex worker from when to when? From 94 to 98. I'm just curious how much you were paid for that work. 50 shillings. It's a tough topic. The challenge that women and girls face around the world is not an easy topic to talk about, but we really think it is the moral challenge of this century. Nick and Cheryl are out there talking about this issue, and not just talking about it kind of theoretically, but they have all these stories about actual girls and women that are going through some of these struggles. That really brings it to life for a much wider audience. Is that red? Or is that a problem, I think? Yes, it is. Do you have a supply of condoms here? No, I'm not in any No, they don't have it. They have to buy it and bring it. You have to buy condoms? As long as the victims are poor, rural, female, illiterate, they don't have voice. Don't want to forget that. <laughs> to be physically present in a place is irreplaceable. Nicholas is right. You have to show up. She's fine. <laughs> she is fine. Okay. This is like a war map, a strategic map. Where do we need someone to fight the enemy? She doesn't have a radial pulse. Disease, death. Celebrities can bring these issues into the limelight. That's just a no-brainer. That's your job, you know, to shine a little light on people that are actually doing the hard lifting. Mate, that one I told you, it's hey. been so. But from a brothel or from... from a brothel? You can't come up with something more beautiful than a young innocent girl and to inflict that experience on that human being is unspeakably cool so she had to have like 10 12 plan a day if she don't want it they beat her i want to empower the survivor to stand up and say no if they want to say no three-year-old it's a three-year-old girl who has been raped and she's just come back for follow-up yeah we shouldn't allow the violence that has been inflicted on women to continue, it must stop, because it can't stop. And they need to be part of the solution. You stay safe, okay? Sometimes the problem feels so big that changing one life doesn't feel like enough. But it is. So every person, every corner of this world, needs to raise a voice and say this has to stop. This is not rocket science. This is not a problem that is unsolvable, that we have to invent something new. It just takes political will. The rights we want, we want to choose our husband. We want to own the land. We want to go to school. We don't want to be cut anymore. We want also to make decisions. We want to participate in politics, to be leaders. We want to be 
l'école. Welcome, everybody. My name is Mikla Beardsley. Sorry for the cold. Um, I'm one of the executive producers of this project, Half the Sky. You've seen there um, an excerpt of our four-hour documentary series, which aired on PBS in October and is beginning to uh, broadcast internationally. This month, actually, it's playing in France uh, as we speak. And um, there are other elements of the project uh, which are not indicated in this. Uh, we've got a Facebook game, which launches today, um, which encourages philanthropic giving and we hope will reach uh, lots and lots of people who wouldn't normally be interested in anything you know, related to women's issues and gender. We've got a big um, network of grassroots ambassadors here in the US and actually um, uh, in colleges around the world who have all um, joined our movement to you know, volunteer and, and um, help raise awareness in their communities and um, also generate uh, revenue for, for new organizations. Um, so we're really excited that um, we were invited uh, to be part of this event with Norway, as we've been saying, um, because the purpose of the Have the Sky project really is to use media um, and storytelling to convene conversations and gatherings that can move us forward in these issues. Um, so tonight, uh, after you know, consideration and conversation with the team at the consulate, we put together a panel of activists who are working on domestic violence issues here in the United States, and they will be joined by the Norwegian Minister of Gender Equality. Um, so let me just introduce briefly our moderator for the evening. Um, her name is Perry Peltz. Uh, she's a distinguished television news journalist and public health advocate. Both in and outside journalism, Perry has pursued a passion for public health and medicine. She recently directed the HBO documentary, The Education of Dee Dee Ricks, which looks at disparities in the US healthcare system through the lens of an unlikely friendship between two very different women battling breast cancer. She's currently in production on a documentary about recidivism in the US prison system, and she hosts a weekly um, radio show on the Sirius Network about public health. And she is a doctoral candidate in public health at Columbia. So she has a lot going on. And uh, please welcome Perry Peltz. Mikola, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, maybe I should stand up. Um, thank you so much for that introduction. It isn't every day that you're introduced by an entire country, being Norway as well as half the sky. Um, so it's my pleasure to be here. I want to introduce you to our wonderful panelists tonight. We really have such a great group of people, so I'm very excited. Um, let us start with Inga Marta Torkidsen. Uh, Inga is the Norwegian Minister of Children, Equality, and Social Inclusion. And here, you're here. Actually. Oh, you're here. I to see the movie. Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah. um, in her political career, Inga engages herself as an advocate for the rights of women, children, and the well-being of families. Inga, welcome. Jackie Payne. Jackie is the director of Move to End Violence, and Move to End Violence is a 10-year program of the Novo Foundation, and it's designed to strengthen our collective capacity to end violence against girls and women in the United States. And among many other positions, Jackie also chaired the National Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence and helped lead the successful campaign to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act. Welcome, Jackie. And because we need a man on a panel, <laughs> where is Ted Bunch? Um, Ted is the co-founder and co-director of A Call to Men. And A Call to Men works to create a world where all men and boys are loving and respectful of women and girls, and women and girls are valued and safe. A Call to Men says it's time that men become part of the domestic violence solution. Ted, welcome. Audrey Moore is our next guest, and Audrey is the chief of the Special Victims Bureau and the chief of the Domestic Violence Unit at the New York County's District Attorney's Office. And in that position, Audrey 
oversees the handling of all domestic violence cases, develops and implements domestic violence policies and procedures, and coordinates and conducts trainings on interviewing, investigating, and prosecuting of domestic violence cases. Welcome. <laughs> and last, but certainly not least, Archie Piatti is the Deputy Director of Sanctuary for Families Immigration Intervention Project. And Sanctuary is the leading nonprofit agency in New York State dedicated exclusively to serving domestic violence victims, sex trafficking victims, and their children. Welcome, everybody. Inga, let's begin with you, if we can. We are here today to talk about domestic violence and how we can help stop the cycle of domestic violence. In order to understand how to end it, we need to understand actually what it is. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you do in your position and what domestic violence is? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Well, domestic violence has to do with uh, gender roles, sex roles. Uh, it has to do with uh, imbalances in power because men have more power than women have. Uh, and it affects children in a most harmful way. Uh, it has to do with power on a systemic level as well as between uh, the sexes. Uh, and of course, if you treat domestic violence as a private issue, yes, you can see it. If you treat domestic violence as a private issue, a private matter, then you, you don't get to the root cause of the problem and you can't handle it. So we have to handle it as a, a, a common cause and that has to be addressed by political means. And that is number one, uh, the number one issue for me as a minister is to, to talk about this as a common, uh, um, a common uh, responsibility. So we have to politicize it, not privatize the problem. Uh, and also we have to work systematically to change the roles of, uh, of uh, the sexes. Uh, and I heard earlier today uh, one of those, uh, Michael Kaufman, who was uh, one of the initiators of, of the White Ribbon campaign. He was very, uh, he was showing in an in, in elegant way how boys are uh, put into roles where not showing emotions not being uh, em empathic towards others is one uh, um, is actually expected from them. And that has also to do with this problem. But not talking about it, this and making it a taboo and putting or making uh, the uh, victims of violence feeling ashamed, not daring to come forward and ask for help, that is a major problem. You know what? Jackie, I was going to ask you the next question, but I'm going to skip over you for the moment and come right back to you because Inga mentions the role of boys and men in this equation, and Ted, that speaks to exactly what you do at A Call to yes. Men. So do you want to talk to us a little bit, really, about what Inga said? Yes. Um, good evening. Uh, you bring up a lot of really great points, and when we look at domestic violence, it is about power and control. But what that's based in, what the foundation of that is, we really have to look at violence against women in general, men's violence against women, as the manifestation of sexism, male dominance, and how it gets played out. Mm. And while oh, the overwhelming majority of violence against women is men's violence, the overwhelming majority of men are not violent, but we are silent about the violence that other men perpetrate, and that's as much of the problem as the violence is itself. In other words, those men who are violent, can only be violent because we don't say something about it. Mm. And we know that exactly. because they're respectful in other areas of their life, with their boss, with uh, their friends. They know how to manage their anger just fine when the police come. So it's not about any of those things. It's about mm -hmm. power and control, domination. And that socialization, how we're taught to be men, we pass that on to our boys mm -hmm. every day with the best of intentions. We're well-meaning men, most of us who are silent, but with the best of intentions, harm women, harm girls, and continue to reinforce, mm -hmm. as you're saying, these gender differences. For instance, whether I was in South Africa and I said to a group of men, 
you, uh, um, do they say things like this to their sons? You got to kick harder than that because you're kicking like a yeah. right. That's socialization, right? Yeah. So <laughs> here in the states, it might be you throw like a Girl. right. So <laughs> now girls throw and kick just fine, but that socialization where these boys who are six years old learning how to kick or learning how to throw, when we as men and well-meaning men, fathers, uncles, coaches, teach them. That you don't that you don't want to be like a girl. That's what it says, right? That you mm -hmm. that's that's not valuable. What's valuable is being male. What's valuable is being dominant. We don't. So therefore, you don't only want to throw like a girl. You don't want to express yourself like a girl. So when you're crying, I want you to stop crying because that's what girls do. You want to wear other something other than black and blue and gray. I don't want you to do that because yellow and pink is what girls wear. Yeah. So all these types of socialization yeah. that continue to reinforce and breed really um, condition our young men to become adult men who don't have value in girls because of course why would they? We, they've never been taught to. And we're gonna. It's interesting. I had lunch with Ted. I guess almost about a year ago, and I remember hearing this for the first time. And it was as though I had never heard this before. But it was such a different way of thinking. And of course, it is the way that we are as a society. You know, we well, can't wear that. Or you. But anyway, we'll talk about that more. Jackie, let me come. Let me come back to you because, of course, the thinking is <clears throat> that girls and women should be safest in their own homes. Right? That's just the way it's supposed to be. But in fact, that's not the reality. So that's actually um, what started our road at Move Time Violence. Um, Move Time Violence is a project of the Novo Foundation, and that's founded by Peter and Jennifer Buffett. And in their foundation, they really try to work for social transformation, and their goal is to create a world in which we're working um, not in terms of domination and oppression, but in terms of partnership and collaboration. And they center all of their efforts really on what they see as the most powerful and untapped resource in the world, which is girls. Uh, but um, we all know that violence against girls is um, prevalent and that it actually presents a real barrier to them um, using their power. And research shows us that when we invest in girls and they're given the chance, not only do they transform their own lives, but they really do invest back and transform their communities. So if we can keep girls safe, we can improve not only their lives, but the lives of their communities. Um, so in the U.S., you know, as in every place, we have a, a high prevalence of domestic and sexual violence, all forms of gender-based violence. Um, and we've had um, a really powerful movement in the past, and we've been able to make you know, great strides. Uh, we've passed a lot of great laws. We have um, a really strong infrastructure. We uh, have done a lot of systems change. There's been a huge cultural shift here in the US over the last 30 years in terms of what's thought of as acceptable. And yet, the rates of violence are outrageous. And the folks who are providing the services are like hamsters on the wheel. They cannot possibly meet the need. And every dollar they get goes, just goes to putting another bed in the shelter because there's always someone waiting. And so Novo asks themselves, you know, what are we not doing here to address this problem if we have this you know, 30 years of great history of making all this change, and yet we're not getting anywhere close to ending violence? Uh, and so they tasked um, their director of uh, girls and women, Pamela Schiffman, and myself in trying to figure out what we could be doing differently. And so um, luckily we knew enough to know that the field is filled with brilliant people and we honored their wisdom and really went to them and we did interviews with well over 200 activists in the field in the United States to ask them about what was the status of the movement and what did they think they needed to do differently. Um, and actually, I, there's a little um, poster out front if you want to pick it up that's kind of like a snapshot of the movement. Um, and in it, you see there's like a, what we heard from those activists in the interviews about what the strengths and challenges are. And it was incredible how resonant the um, interviews were. Like person after person was just telling us the same story. And essentially what they told us is, you know, we have had decades of a strong movement. We did, we were really successful in passing the Violence Against Women Act, which meant lots of government funding lots of support for services, um, but as a result, over time, we've become really service focused and we're spending almost all of our energy, almost all of our <laughs> money goes to and almost all of our energy goes to addressing the issue of violence. So it's a lot of services and then systems reform, how, we're, how cops and courts are dealing with survivors. Um, and almost none of our money goes to uh, social change or advocacy, mm -hmm. and almost a very small percentage of our efforts are actually focused on ending violence against girls and women. The kinds of culture shifting work we'd have to do to change our efforts from getting enough money for another bed to figuring out a way to make it stop. 
And so that's actually what provoked the Novo Foundation to start Move to Unviolence, to try to um, shift the energy and the focus and the resources so that we are now as a movement working towards ending violence against girls and women. Jackie, thank you. As she said, ja um, cops and courts and how they are dealing with the violence and ending the violence. And of course, that's a wonderful introduction, Audrey, to you. You're on the front lines dealing with this, with the district attorney's office. Talk to us, if you can, a little bit about what you are seeing on the front lines, really, of this fight. Well, I would say as you look at, if you can pick up any newspaper and you watch the news, you see a story of domestic violence all the time. And if you think about how underreported domestic violence is, you know, it takes six to seven times for a woman to finally leave a man. How many times, how many instances aren't reported? It's extremely over um, underreported. And as crime, you know, New York, I have to say, New York City was you know, very lucky and that crime was dropping. But what we saw about domestic violence cases where they were still steadily increasing. Now some of that we might say is that we're getting better and people are feeling more comfortable about coming forward and reporting, but the numbers are still going up. Last year, for example, the police department, just to put this in context a little bit about New York um, City, um, responded to 263,270 domestic violence incidences. And that's approximately 720 incidences a day. Um, those numbers continuously keep on going up. So unfortunately, there's a lot of work for us to continue to, to do because the violence is still there. And we're seeing it um, not only in domestic violence, you're seeing it in intimate partner sexual assaults, which is something that's not really talked about. A lot of times when you talk about sexual assault, you only talk about the stranger rapes. That's 20% mm. of the cases. 80% right. of these cases are intimate partner sexual yeah. assault. And it's really, we need to get these movements together to really start to communicate. And human trafficking, now when we look at cases that come in, if someone is a victim of prostitution, we're looking at that and sometimes saying, wait, is this a human trafficking case? Mm. Because they might be saying pimp and prostitute, we might be saying that, but the language they're using sometimes is boyfriend, girlfriend. And then when you really start to take the layers away, this is someone who's been trafficked. So I think that really the courts and I should say the prosecutors in our office and the Special Victims Bureau who have been trained, we really are looking through these cases and looking at the world through a different lens and just really taking everything that we learn from advocates about how we can identify domestic violence. Archie, talk to us about Sanctuary and the work that you do. You're dealing, you are a service provider. Can you tell us a little bit about the women you're seeing? Sure, I can definitely do that. Let me just start by saying thank you very much to Half the Sky and also to the Norwegian government, the, the permanent mission, as well as uh, the consulate here for taking this time, this pause, to really think about violence against women and girls, gender-based violence, as we see it here in the U.S., here in New York. Uh, this is an, such an, uh, we're hearing some numbers, we're hearing some statistics, but I think, you know, what, what gets me, Sanctuary for Families, you know, we're a big organization, we're 150 staff members, but to understand that we last year alone in 2012 served nearly 11,000 people, that's, you know, that could make me proud, but it actually makes me incredibly sad. 11,000 girls, women, boys, and men who've been Whose, whose dignity, whose right to their safety has been violated by somebody who thought they had the power and, and utilized their control to hurt that individual. That's going on right now all over this city as we're sitting here in this room. That's something that I feel like, you know, we need to stop and think about. And this event is exactly here for all of you to take that time and join us in thinking about this. So thank you for that opportunity. Um, what we see at Sanctuary, I, I was struck by the, by the brief trailer we got to watch um, because everything that we saw going on in those far off dusty villages shockingly is happening right here. Mm. Believe it or not, not just domestic violence. We all may have read some stories or heard about domestic violence even at the highest political levels are, are, there's domestic violence happening. But even things like honor crimes, forced marriage, female genital mutilation, sex trafficking, sex slavery, it's happening right here. That's what we see at Sanctuary. I'm, an I'm in the immigration department um, and I work mostly with immigrant women. Sanctuary is, you know, we're a nonprofit, we're pro bono, all of our services are free, um, and we're lucky to be located in uh, the family justice centers around the city where women, men, boys and girls can walk in and say, I need help, I need to see a prosecutor, I need to see a police officer, I need to see uh, somebody who understands 
my community and my culture and can offer me services. And we're in those offices, so we, we, we see a lot of variety in the types of violence that's going on around New York. And I'm constantly stunned by the fact that even here, even in New York, we're seeing this type of violence. The laws are there. The laws exist. We need better laws all the time. We want to make, we want to, we want improvements. But in fact, it's political will. It's also each of us taking responsibility for that violence. You know, when I first came to Sanctuary, I had been a lawyer for a while. I had been, uh, you know, thinking about human rights on the international scale for <coughs> many years. And I never had once heard somebody in New York, I never had once heard anybody in the United States, and now somebody in New York say to me, I'm about to go through FGM, female genital mutilation, and I'm scared for my life. I couldn't believe it. Here? That was a girl who's 16 years old sitting in a high school in the Bronx, and this was actually a reality for her. And the more we investigated and the more we studied, the more we realized how prevalent this problem is and how incredibly silenced and quiet these victims are. And it's because of their fear of coming forward. Now, the numbers are going up in who's reporting, and that's a little bit encouraging, also sad, but that people are coming forward. But there are still many, many kinds of violence that nobody's addressing and nobody's even talking about yet in New York. Yeah, I think all too often we don't want to look in our own backyard. Yeah. You know, it's a little, it can be very frightening. Um, but Inga, interestingly, Norway has had some successes. When we start to talk about policy and intervention and how to stop the cycle of violence, you have had some successes. I'd love to do this round of questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience. I promise I won't talk the whole time. But um, tell us a little bit about what you've been able to do from a policy perspective to end this cycle. Uh, well, um, I think I would have to say that violence, men's violence against women in Norway is a very big issue and it's not decreasing. Or at least we don't know, but what we see on the statistics, and, that, and I think that's encouraging, as uh, Archie said, because I think that's a response to us taking it more seriously, talking more about it so that they feel not as ashamed as before, and they feel that it's okay to ask for help. And I've seen, uh, I was elected as a member of parliament in 2001, and I was member of the Standing Committee on Justice at that time, because I wanted to fight violence against women and children in their homes. And, and I saw that police was, uh, by, uh, at that time, they were quite bad at handling it. Uh, and gradually, they started to take this more seriously, and within uh, the police and, and, and the, uh, the Ministry of Justice, this has been high on the agenda for over 10 years. And that is very good. But I also see that when it comes to, to the health sector, for instance, they are more reluctant to taking this seriously because they think that people should be able to come to them and feel safe. And they shouldn't uh, uh, think that maybe this uh, personnel will report them to someone if they seek help, for instance. And they don't address the issue of violence. They address health, they address psychiatric diseases, uh, disorders, and, and um, diagnosis, but they don't address the issue of violence. And we know that this is a major health issue. And when we ask the patients, have you had experiences with, with violence? So many say, yes, I have, but you have to address it. And also we know that when it comes to incest, which is the most tab of the, the area with the uh, most taboo, tabo tabooized, <laughs> how do you say that? Um, and we know that it takes uh, approximately 17 and a half years before they actually talk about it because it is so stigmatized and they feel so much shame. So you have to address it. And we have actually been inspired by the United States and by, by Iceland uh, to establish uh, uh, houses called children's houses. And I was, uh, I was um, uh, putting uh, um, a uh, proposal in, in the parliament in 2004 for this. And now we have eight houses where children and their families can come if they have been uh, subject to abuse, sexual abuse, uh, uh, violence, domestic violence, uh, trafficking. You have, yeah. All, all of these issues, female genital mutilation and so on. And that is very good, and we see that it is an in, uh, increase in numbers, but I, I think it has to do with them feeling more 
safe to come forward and, and ask for help. But we have major problems in Norway. And, and what I feel is that so many people in Norway, they think that we are, we are uh, a gender equal country. This hasn't got so much to do with us anymore. This has to do with the others, immigrants, for instance. And so they, they yeah, they, they uh, feel uh, distanced to this problem. And I am worried about that. And I, I was a bit thoughtful when, when I listened to you, Jackie, because you said that uh, uh, it's been, we've been very service focused and very little on advo advocacy. And I, I think maybe that is a bit of the same picture in Norway. Well, it's funny because it's interesting you say that the police aren't necessarily very good at handling it. And Audrey made me think about the fact that I don't know how it is now, but I remember when I was reporting, women don't like to come forward, don't want to come forward and feel that their complaints won't be taken seriously or they'll be shamed. Are we doing better at having the police being better at, at, at handling it? And, and law enforcement, are we taking it seriously enough and allowing women to feel safe if they come forward? Well, I should say New York had to actually put into play a mandatory arrest uh, policy which basically stated that if there are certain charges of domestic violence, it's not into the police's decision, the police officer's decision as to whether or not they're going to make an arrest. They have to make an arrest. And part of the reason they did that is in the past, you know, there would be a call of domestic violence. The cops would come on the scene and they would either separate and mediate, you know, walk the victim around, the, you know, walk the, the batter around the corner saying, <coughs> you know, just calm down, you know, she's having a bad day, mm -hmm. and say, do you really want to do this to the father of your child? And out of that came mandatory arrest. Now, that's a whole other discussion, the good and the bad of mandatory arrest, because it's somewhat controversial. But what I do think has happened is that the police department has become more responsive. Mm -hmm. They have domestic violence police officers now at each police station. And, you know, if a victim can get in and see a domestic violence police officer, these people have been specially trained to deal with domestic violence. And they also now go more on home visits just to check in. So if you, for example, if we have a case and we're very concerned about um, a victim, we can call up the police and say, can you just check in and ring the doorbell and, let, and check to make sure that victim knows they're not alone. We're here and we're looking out for them. So I do think that the police department has really made um, leaps and gains in terms of how they're treating domestic violence. But, you know, training is always good, and yeah. everybody's always <laughs> going to say is we always can use to, you know, for more training. But mm -hmm. it's a start. Jackie, what are your thoughts about what Ingo was saying? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, I mean, of course I want to say that... Um, <coughs> I don't want to in any way discount the importance of the services piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have made huge strides as a result yeah. of the emphasis on that. And, you know, it's first, certainly I totally honor the work that's being done in the field currently. So it is an absolutely essential piece. And I think for us, the realization is that it can't be, it can't be so um, uh, unbalanced, right? Now it's like 95% of that and 5% of the other. And we need to find some balance. And we need to think about the way that we're doing services that is um, tied up with social change and advocacy so that you're doing empowerment and leadership development and engagement of survivors um, and their families and, and your sort of constituency as we go. Um, what we found in when we were researching with the field of advocates, they were feeling um, really uh, kind of exhausted from being on this hamster's wheel, right? And feeling like, oh my God, not, you know, we're trying so hard and we can't solve the problem. We know we have to do something different. And they were hungry for something more and different. Um, and so when we started the Move Time Balance program, it was really based on what they told us they needed, which, um, interesting, people said to us, don't give us any more money just without any ties, because if you give it to me, I have to get put it into services. I can't stand the fact that this woman is standing outside the door and I don't have a bed for her. So if you just give me the money, I have to, uh, you know, for my conscience, get that next bed. But I know, you know uh, that I need a different strategy, so help us find a different strategy. So we actually created a program to take some of the most um, innovative, inspirational leaders across the country, bring them together, and give them the time and space to step back and be out of crisis mode, and to really think about what is the vision for the future of this movement? What are we really trying to achieve? And then how, what's the strategy that we need that will be a long-term strategy? We're not going to end violence in you know, five years, but what's the long-term strategy that's multidimensional so that different <laughs> folks across the movement, whether they're working on sexual abuse or child abuse or domestic violence, can come together and be under one umbrella 
and really start to shift from a services only to a services and social change model, mm -hmm. and that we're working together to try to achieve that kind of social change. And actually, Ted was in our first cohort, <laughs> and Archie's in our current cohort. So we're, I'm in great company of the kind of leaders that we're looking for across the country of folks who you know, have all this practical experience, they know it in their bones about what the reality is, and now they're just having the opportunity to sit with their peers and to develop the vision and the strategy and really a path forward for the movement. So um, our hope is over the next eight years, as we continue to do this work, that we create a critical mass of leaders who are aligned around a common vision, moving the same direction that they've created, and really have a new um, enhanced set of social change skills so they have the capacity to affect the kind of change that they're dreaming of. So, so Ted, to that, to that point, I remember what one of the things that you had said to me that really struck me is that women are trying to fix this problem, and men, in, in, in order for this problem to ever be fixed, if it can ever be fixed, that men need to be a part of the solution. Otherwise, it doesn't go forward, mm -hmm. right? What do they say? Your equation is only as fast as your slowest step, right. Right? right? So tell us, from your perspective, how do we start to engage men in this solution? Well, thank you, Perry. And um, there's so much I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here wanting to respond to so many things because that really is the solution. Women have been at the forefront doing the heavy lifting from the beginning of time. And, but the truth of the matter is that men, alongside of women, and even with the leadership of women, that men need to be involved. And if we're not, it's never going to end. It makes sense that if we're most of the problem, we're probably going to be most of the solutions. Mm -hmm. So having the services and the service beds and all that is important. We want to continue to do that. But what about preventing it? Because these are all interventions. Right? That's all intervention. Something's happened, we have to do something about it. What about preventing it? And the way we need to prevent it, because whether it's um, a man who's hitting uh, his wife or girlfriend, and, and Audrey and I have worked together for years. I ran the largest batterers program in the, in the country here in New York City for 12 years before founding A Call to Men. I don't know, I had uh, 600 men a week in the program, all court-mandated men. Um, and domestic violence didn't get reduced. Actually, many of the men felt like they were being picked on. And in a way they were, because they were the first generation of men being held accountable for something men have always gotten away with. Yeah. So these men are saying, what? my father used to beat my mother a lot worse than I'm doing. What, what do you, what, you know, give me a break here. What are you bothering me for? Right? So patriarchy throughout, we have to look at this. Because it's not only harmful to women and children, but it's harmful to men. That because our liber it's not just about the liberation of women. Actually, the liberation of men is directly tied to the liberation of women. And we are so um, um, boxed in. We have this concept called the man box. We are so boxed in, and we need to break out of this man box. So when we look at violence against women and engaging men, we want to educate men. We want to engage them. We want to empower them to talk to other men. I know empower and manhood seems a little strange, right? <laughs> But in this, in this instance, we do need to know how to talk to other men because part of this whole gender-based violence thing is that homophobia is a big part of it. Yes. So that if I do something that's, for, that's right but happens to be for a woman, mm -hmm. many men will think that somehow I'm not a man, mm -hmm. right? And even as we challenge other men, men might say, what's wrong with you? Mm -hmm. you know? like, because we're so conditioned in the patriarchy mm -hmm. to give men the benefit of the doubt and to blame women for the violence that men perpetrate. Well, why'd she have that on? Well, if she just listened to what he said, she knows what buttons to push, doesn't she? All of those things that blame women for men's behavior. So as we engage men, I'm so encouraged to see the men that are here today. Mm -hmm. And we need to be, there needs to be more of us because we need to, to own our responsibility because ultimately, as mu if, if, if women could have ended it simply from saying stop it to men, if men, re I shouldn't say it that way. If men respected the voice of women, we wouldn't have, be having this conversation. If men respected the experience of women, we wouldn't be having this conversation. But we don't. Our socialization is that you're here to serve us, to meet our needs, and actually you'll find when women don't do that, like, I don't know, I'll say Hillary Clinton, for instance. We have all kinds of words for her and names for her because she doesn't fit into that box that we've created for women in this patriarchy. So um, in short, I just want to say <laughs> that 
really, we have to become part of the solution, that women are already part of the solution. They're doing it. But we have to become part of the solution, too. And that means raising our voices. That means saying to our buddy, hey, man, listen, I'm offended by that. What you just said, I'm offended by. It's not about protecting or saving women. It's about men not being violent, and safety takes care of itself. So if those are long-term goals, Archie, what are the immediate interventions that need to take place? What are the best practices? Well, we, you know, we at Sanctuary, we have, it's not rocket science for us. We have a, we have a model. We've developed it organically over the last 25, 30 years. And we started as a shelter. Why? Because if you take a woman out of a violent situation and give her safety, the cobwebs start to clear and she starts to see the way she's been treated. Then what does she need? She needs a counselor. She needs somebody to talk to, not, not just to process what happened, that's very important, but also to think about where is she going next? How does a person who's never been allowed to make a decision for herself or hasn't in a long time start rebuilding a sense of self-esteem and a sense of uh, empowerment, a sense of who she can be if she tries? Then she needs to get a job. How's she going to live? I mean, welfare, these programs we have in New York are good, but it's that they don't last forever and they don't give you enough to really sustain yourself and your, fa and your children if you're in that position. So she needs a job. Well, we have at Sanctuary, uh, we have these services. We also have an economic empowerment program, which is a very important cornerstone of what we do. Job training, English language services, you know, get women not only at minimum wage, part-time kinds of jobs, but really you know, working in jobs that are, that are part of her empowerment, not just part of her escape. The next piece, of course, is, uh, for me anyway, in the work that I do, None of that is possible if she can't uh, call, feel empowered to call the police, to go, uh, to travel in the country, to do the things she needs to do without a visa, without a green card, without the right to be here in this country legally. So of course we find that intervening in the immigration part is incredibly important. But all of this is, you know, like you said, it's the immediate needs, it's the service, but it, that's not where it ends. Most of the women I work with, they're very grateful, they walk away. What do they do next? They want to call, they want to talk to somebody else who's going through what they've been through. They want to reach out to another, if it's a young woman, she wants to blog about her issues and, and connect online with other young woman, women. If it's an older woman, she wants to sit in circle and talk in her language about her problems with other women. We see a lot of group dynamics and group power coming out from survivors, from people who know what the experience really is. And their voices power our advocacy. So we do system change advocacy. We are out in the communities. We're working very hard to try to bring the voices of those who've experienced what we're all talking about here, this gender violence, and change to call men, but not just all of us in this room, yes, men and women, but also the men in the community who are the perpetrators, the men who are saying, no, but Allah says, no, but Jesus says, no. Mm -hmm. We need to get the religious leaders. We need to get the men in those communities and the women who are themselves perpetrating violence, such as FGM and forced marriage, everybody needs to be a part of that conversation. <coughs> none of us, thank you for everything you're doing, Ted, but none of us, women or men, is really free. I have kept my mouth shut in my life right. when I've heard of somebody else ex experiencing abuse. If you really think about it, a lot of us have, and that may have been before we knew, and we were educated about this issue, and now it's time to stop that and to take a stand and to join with victims, to join with survivors, and understand that these people are the voice of the movement. They are the ones who are going to change the way this works for us in the next century. Let's hear from, from audience members. I, I could sit here and ask questions all day, but I'd love to hear from anybody. That, yes, back there. Hi. Hi. My name is Bronwyn Galloway. I'm a delegate with Earth Child Institute, as well as representing UNA San Francisco. Oh, thank you. I want to take a, an idea from the Half the Sky book, fantastic book, if none of you have read, if some of you haven't read it, please read it. The authors bring up an idea about keeping the purchase of sex illegal, but making the sale of sex legal. So we wouldn't be legalizing prostitution per se, we'd be dividing it in half. And I'm wondering if any of you have a comment on that, on the how likely is that to come to fruition? Yeah, and that's a, that's a complex question. So basically, in, in summation, the purchase of sex 
would be illegal, the sell, uh, sale of sex would be legal. So Inga, do you want to speak about it? Well, it, it, that is the case in Norway, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and how is that working? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we don't know yet because it's uh, quite new. But I would say that, well, I hope that it works to, um, to uh, change attitudes. Uh, well, it was put into force in uh, 2009, 1st of January, yeah, 2009. So it's quite new. But uh, we are actually discussing these days because we, don't, we have an election this fall, and um, some of the conservatives, they want to change this law and make it legal again to buy sex. Um, I, was, I, I was actually a bit um, crit critical to this. Law. Not because I, I totally agree with the aim of it, and the focus is put on the buyer. That is so uh, so right to do. Yeah. That I was very scared whether these women and and men, but mostly women in prostitution, would be more exposed to violence. And I was also critical that we didn't involve them in the discussion before we put the law forward. So I would say that it's very important too to take them into account, respect them, listen to what they have to say. But I would definitely go for this law. Audrey, anything you want to add from the law enforcement perspective for this country or not? No. <laughs> okay. I'll pass on that. <laughs> That'll be a pass. I think okay. we'll pass on that. Bronwyn, question. thank you. Anybody, any other questions? Yeah, right there under the light. This question is for Jackie or Ted talked a lot about progress that we've made in terms of changing systems, law enforcement, um, the political aspect, but I'm wondering just in terms of changing social and behavioral norms, um, just the challenges that go into that, if you could speak a little bit to how the pornography um, industry and the music industry create a big challenge in changing social norms when no matter what great education programs we put in place, there's kind of this constant pushback that is always being put into the minds of men starting at a very young age. Okay. Uh, thank you for that great question. Well, social norm change and cultural norm change is absolutely the key. It's really where it really has to happen. Um, but as you say, in pornography in particular, when we, when we look at the socialization of men and how we pass that socialization down to our boys and particularly um, as it relates to women and girls, there's three main components that a call to men talks about and teaches, which all men are socialized, whether not to say that I believe it or that men here believe it, but that's what we're taught. That's why we know what those answers to the questions are. Like that women and girls have less value than men and boys, that women and girls are, or, the, or that women are the property of men. That's why if a man's hitting a woman on the street and I walk over to him, he's going to say what to me? Get out of my face. Right, or mind your business, right. something like that. Right, because we're taught that whole privacy piece that you had talked mm -hmm. about earlier. That privacy was based on man and what man owned, everything in the house, including his 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 wife, certainly here in the United States. So the issue of less value, property, and objectification—that we're taught to objectify women—and actually, if we don't, and other men see that we don't, they'll say things like, "What's wrong with you?" Right. So those three things, when you look at those, less value, property, and objectification, with Pornography and commercial, exp and commercial exploitation, sexual exploitation, is kind of where they meet. Mm -hmm. And it gets played out and acted out. So with my 16-year-old, uh, he's 15, my, with my 16-year-old son, what my concern is around, not only just around pornography, but around what it, now I don't know of him seeing it, but he's a 15-year-old boy. <laughs> Right? I have so, one of those. Does that mean yeah, he's got yeah, pornography yeah, too? Yeah, uh, well, well, you know, now, now, it's, it's, you know, Perry, it's the, it used to be in my age, you know, if you found an uncle's book or something, that was, that was it, and that was a big deal. Now you just click on, oh, you right. might, you might put in Facebook, right. um, pork rinds and hit the N instead of the K, and now you're on a porn site, right? I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's that easy. So, so. Um, but what the pornography teaches, it's not, it doesn't embrace love and respect for women. What it, talks, what it, what it really teaches is abuse and degradation of women, right? So this is what our, 
our young men see as, well, this must be sexuality. And this is the way, I'm, so I'm supposed to call her the B word. I'm supposed to degrade her. I'm supposed to do these things. They don't, it's not, it's not, you know, uh, you know, not something that's teaching love and respect for women. So when we look at our culture, uh, and even with the music industry, you know, again, I 15 year old son listens to hip hop all the time. I love hip hop, but it's not what I used to listen to, right? So, but even with the pornography and with the music, I don't want to demonize those things because it didn't originate with this generation. It was passed down to them. We have, now they have their own spin on it now, but Hugh Hefner was making a lot of money off of objectifying women for the last 50 years. It's not just in the, in the hip hop video that we see that. So what, what, you know, when we talk about socialization, this newest generation and those who are marketing toward that generation have just put a spin on it for that generation. But objectifying women, less value of women, and seeing women as property is in the fabric of our society. So it's just how it's played out now. So yes, we need to have um, those, um, those sectors of our community uh, really respond to that. And I want to believe that those men who are, who are making decisions in, that, in those areas, I'm hoping that, um, that they're as misinformed as most men about the impact of it. But Ted, so we need as to have, parents, and, I, and yes. I want to make sure we get, we get to other questions, but quickly, as, as parents, what are we supposed to do? Because you know what? It is so much, you're right, a part of our, of our world. And I, you know, I'm joking about my son, but the fact of the matter is I'm sure that that's exactly what happens. And what are we supposed to do as parents? What's the best advice? That's to me too. <laughs> okay. Well, I know that for that for that for my children, that, that they know that I have a certain expectation of their behavior and what they're allowed to do. Now, I'm not with them all the time, and they're at their friend's house, and they're going to experiment and they're going to do things. Um, so what what I want to do is have a, a relationship with them where he can come to me and talk to me about right. things, and hope that that's going to happen. Is it going to happen all the time? No, it's not. But, but at least it's a step. Yeah, but he knows that what the standard is because I like to think that the apple doesn't fall too fall far from the tree, fall too far from the tree, and that eventually he'll have a marker that he can go back to. Fair enough. And I just want to add that it's, yeah, by the time you're 14, like you've got, you had a lot of other influences, right? So, I mean, we have a nice range of parenthood here from like <laughs> two and a half to 21, I think. Um, so we were kind of talking earlier about all the, you know, the experiences we have with our kids and. Um, certainly it's like, what, are, what images are, is my three-year-old getting right now in terms of what boys are supposed to do, what girls are supposed to do? Is he allowed to have the tiara or the tutu, God forbid? You know, and so it's just, I feel like actually it's really starting there. And I, like every time I get a plane with my son, we talk about whether the pilot might be a man or a woman. And I love it. He's like, do you think it's a girl today? And I'm like, maybe. It isn't usually. But, you know, we hope for the girl. And so I just feel like that, to me, that's where you have to start. And then by the time you get to porn... You know, you have already dealt with the fact that your eight-year-old daughter is being introduced to a thong, you know, as a, right. her underwear choice. So, yeah. <laughs> welcome to America. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, this question is for Ted. Um, you had talked about how um, men wouldn't be violent if um, others weren't complicit. So I wanted to ask you about, um, just to follow up, about Rihanna and Chris Brown. How do you think the media have been complicit? And um, how do you think they sh or, you know, or the record labels or whoever, how they should have actually approached this situation? That's a good question. Uh, that's a great question. Um, so I, don't, if, uh, I didn't mean to say that men wouldn't be violent. I don't know if, they, if that's 100 percent, but they wouldn't be able to get away with it because we would say that's not cool. And that what I know about men is that we want to be respected by other men. So if us saying that's not cool starts redefining and reshaping what manhood looks like, because right now most men feel like, well, if she doesn't do what I say, I'm supposed to do something about that. That's what, so that's what comes up for men. And some men do it physically. Most men don't do it physically, but we do it in other ways. Like, I have the last word in this conversation, those kind of things. So, um, and as far as Chris Brown and Rihanna, I mean, I have a lot of, feelings about it. I feel like, first of all, that um, uh, I don't think that even it would have hit the media in the way that it did if, uh, well, it's obvious that there were a lot of Rihannas that day, three women a day in the mm -hmm. United States, and three women a day since then have been killed, right? 
So that's, that's, that's who's been killed. Who's been actually beaten uh, is about 12 women a second in the United States. I'm sorry, one woman every 12 seconds in the, U, in the United States. So there's a lot of women who are not getting the attention that Rihanna got. So I, I, I kind of have a reaction to that. Like, you know, it's great that we're this, this, is, this awareness has come up, but it's like there's a lot of other women there. Then with Chris Brown, initially, when he was 17 years old about when he did this, he was very young, 18 maybe, right? You know, uh, our perspective really was, well, he, this was a socialization. How did he know at 18 years old what to do when a woman got him angry? This is part of his socialization. Why did he feel like that was okay? When his buddies get him angry, he doesn't hate his buddy, right? So why is it okay? How did he know that he could do that, that that was the response? Mm. So that's our socialization. So now what it teaches us is that Rihanna going, um, Chris Brown winning her back, and I say winning her back because the man who showed up to get her back was not the man who hit her. In other words, he didn't show up punching her in the face saying, come back to me. He was the same man, of course, but he presents differently. So he came back with the charming, loving man that she first fell in love with. So there's control and manipulation even within that, right? So, uh, and, and, and as was said earlier, six to seven times it takes for a woman to leave. Mm -hmm. So I don't even want to, I don't even feel like focusing on Rihanna mm. is, is something we need to do. No. It's really around Chris Brown and his control and getting her back. And I think that we really let him off the hook and men like him off the hook to hold him accountable in a way. In one way he's held himself, he did what he was supposed to do. He did the community service and all those things. But I don't think the media used this as an opportunity to really teach to the, to the moment. And I also think that there's a racial dynamic to it as well. I got to say that, that if this was a white couple or a white male, I don't think we'd still be talking about Chris Brown or Chris White. We're talking, we're, <laughs> I don't think we would. I don't. We're talking about Oscar Pistorius. Yeah. We're talking about. Right, we right, are. We we've are. got Let's a local see. news anchor yes, here in, yes, this, in this market, yes, we are. right? But this is four years. No, no, that's true. Later. That's absolutely that's all true. I'm no, no, I understand that. And there yeah. certainly is yeah, that we're element. We're still talking about Right. RJ, any, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I just wanted to comment on a couple of questions now that have touched on. Um, you know, there was the excellent question about demand side and should we be prosecuting uh, on the demand side, which I personally believe 100% we should be. Um, there was also a question, you know, the issue of media. I think that we have to be very careful not to be passive recipients of the language and the tone used in the media about not only that story, but so many others. You know, we see on, on the covers of so many local papers here, as well as the national papers, words that are very judgmental when talking about victims, whether they be men, boys, girls, or, uh, or, 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 or women. Um, words that are, you know, that imply a level of choice or a level mm. of, um, uh, like, wor words like prostitute, for example. Right. Now, why do I think that that's a problem? Because I have heard firsthand exactly what that relationship is when you are engaged, when you're being prostituted, when somebody is using their, their material uh, wealth, their immigration status, their physical power, their, um, their, their knowledge that society would never penalize them, when somebody's using all those tools against you to force you in, into, into sexual slavery, to exploit you commercially, sexually, when somebody's doing that to you, where are you supposed to go? What power do you have in that dynamic? None. How are you then making a choice to be a prostitute? No, you're being prostituted. You are being exploited. You are trafficked. There are ways in which we choose our words to tell a story as part of this, uh, this society, this community, that affect the way the young men and boys coming up, the young girls and women coming up, view the role that women and men should play in this society. So if I sit and I understand that, you know, Leno has made a, a very um, a piggish comment about a woman or uh, it's happened on another late night talk show, should I just say, wow, that's, that guy's awful, click. You know, I should be speaking out about that. I should be tweeting about that. I should be just joking about how hard it is for me to get tweeting, get my head around tweeting, but I should be tweeting about that. I should be uh, writing about that to my friends. I should be writing letters to the editor every day because every day in the papers there's something going on. And all of us in this room can do that. Even if your job has nothing to do with violence, you can do that. You can be somebody who says we won't tolerate this kind of messaging in the media out there. That's how we go from being reactive to being a movement, not just a movement of people who work in this day in and day out, 
but a movement of people like you all in this room who are actually doing something to stop violence. We have time for another question. Yeah. Go ahead. That's what I'm doing now is whenever I see something, I'll say something. And I feel like I've been labeled the women's rights person or you're such a feminist, you know? And like, I think, um, like I've been trying to put my boyfriend, you know, to be like, come on, you know, you get on my boat too, you know, like for women's rights. And he's kind of like what you said, Ted, well, I don't know, because it's kind of a private matter. And like, you know, like what we have, um, we have our, um, a couple, who was really good friends with my boyfriend and he he they're fine you know with their relationship but I think at times he'll get mad at what he said or what whatever she says or maybe she's taking a long time in the bathroom or getting ready and he's like you know he'll curse at her and say something and I'm like you know you should really say something I mean that's your friend and he's like well I don't think I should say anything and I'm like why not he's like because that's his business and I'm like yeah but I mean that's not okay it's not okay for you it's not okay for me I'm not okay with it and I feel like if I said something, it'd be this, you know, this whole thing of women and women and, you know, women's rights. And it's all it's all about women. And I'm trying to, you know, fight for these women. But like like you said, it's so important to get to get men on the on the on this movement. But how can we when it's such a so that, big that's a great that's a great question. Let me Ted, do you want to respond to that? How do we get our men collectively on board? Right. And well, well, sorry, no, Sandra, sorry to interrupt you, but like, I know it's been addressed already, but it's also kind of like um, something that we've been talking about. I work at the Greenwich Domestic Abuse Services in, in, um, in Connecticut, and I'm part of the, I'm a community educator and bilingual advocate. And one of the big things is, you know, in New York City, you see, um, after the whole terrorism thing, you say, you know, you see in the subways that sign, what does it say? Exactly, but when you see something with domestic violence, you don't, you don't, you don't say anything. You don't. There's nothing. There's like no movement really to like really address that. You know, and it's everywhere. So how can you know how is terrorism, you know, this big problem, and domestic violence is this big problem as well? But we're not doing anything about it. Many more people are dying. Exactly. Through the domestic, the terrorism that's happening through domestic violence. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah uh, there are a number of, I think the, the, the campaigns that you're talking about that everyone knows, um, there are a number of campaigns for domestic violence also and sexual assault. Called, one is called No More, there's another called Break, uh, Breakthrough, there's a number of things. So, we are r raising awareness, so we have to do much more than that. But you're absolutely right. So, uh, it can be that individual man who has to know what to say. And then, you know, to, so to bring them to things like this, to engage men in, their, in your community, but also, and we're doing some work around public service announcements and those kind of things that get out there that kind of normalize this conversation in a different way, especially for men. So that's really what has to happen is that we have to raise awareness, just like we did. The perfect example for me is 10, 15 years ago, DWIs, driving while intoxicated, mm -hmm. there wasn't a response, but now there's uh, overwhelming response and if we were to leave here right now and see somebody in there getting in their car with a bottle and their keys we would all know that mm -hmm. we had to do something where 15 years ago that wouldn't have happened that's social change so that same type of social change has to happen the difference is mothers against drunk driving who started their campaign started it because there were suburban kids being killed they have value women in our in our in our society don't have that same value so we need to really address that issue of valuing women, because that's what it gets down to. So the way to pull men in is to uh, really address that this is impacting women in your life, right? Because as a good guy, and I'll make it really short, but as a good guy, a well-meaning man like the men we have here, most men are this way and don't feel like it's our problem because we don't do those things. And we may not even spend time with men who do those things. But because my daughter, who just graduated college, who lived off campus, never been sexually assaulted. She was with two other young women who had never been sexually assaulted, lived off campus for their last year in Charlottesville. She went to UVA, right? And asked me when I moved in, can you leave me a pair of your old shoes to put outside the door? Never, been, never had domestic violence or sexual assault. Why would she need to do that? And your daughter's doing something the same thing today. So wh whether it's park, making sure that she parks by a lit area when she comes out, or not working late, or she's a runner and doesn't get, can't run until the sun comes up, there's all kinds of things that women have to do on a daily basis because they live with us, even though most of us would not harm them. But they have to act as if all of us were. So if we can connect men, we've got to connect the dots for men. And the women in the congregation said, 
Amen. <laughs> yeah. we, you know, that's what we got to do. So we just connected that. But can I, you know, and one of the things I just wanted to say, like in terms of, I'm going to tell you, you always have to be that person who's going to sit there and continuously say, mm -hmm. you have to, you have to check people. And you know, I'm the big person, big mouth person in my office, and that's okay. You know, I claim it, I own it, but you have to speak up. And one of the things I will just say that we were talking about our kids and what do you do? I have an 18 year old. Um, uh, my lovely son is in college, and somebody on his floor beat up a girl, uh, beat up, I should say, a young lady. And he called me, and he was like, "I am so uncomfortable about this. What do I do?" And we had a conversation about it. So, it, you know what I'm just saying? It rubs off because I made sure that he knew what to do. Number one, to make sure the people at his college knew what happened, but also because the young lady went to a different college. I was able to give him tools to make sure that they knew what happened, you know, to make sure that they're working on both sides about holding them accountable. But what I like to say is, you know, so all these things, you just always have to remember, um, you know, to speak up. And I will tell you, the beauty of technology right now, and us all having these, you know, everybody has phones on their cameras, you know, bystanders, we're seeing this a lot more and more in terms of prosecutions that people are calling and people are sitting there saying, I'm seeing this domestic violence thing. You know, they're calling, they're reporting it. And many of our cases are being proven now with people who are ear witnesses and eyewitnesses to what's going on. But one of the things I think we just have to say about what we need to do in terms of how do you get the message, and we talked about a little bit about Rihanna and Chris Brown, is we have to look at changing the message for children early on. Mm -hmm. Every school, it should be required that there would be lectures about what is a healthy relationship. And in many places, that is fought. You know, that, you know, they want to talk about sexually transmitted diseases, maybe. You want to talk about all these other things. What is a healthy relationship is important. Our school, go, you know, our office goes in. We develop curriculums to go and talk about what's healthy. And you, it's amazing when you have these conversations with, I say they really probably need to start in elementary school. Um, but so many people don't think, oh, we don't want to talk about it. It really needs to be part of every school curriculum because that's how you're going to change the norms as well. Jackie, I'm curious to hear what you think because what Ted was talking about is a social movement, right? And that's what you're trying to do and what you're doing. So can you add on to what they were saying? Well, I mean, there's a reason that I asked Ted to be in the cohort. Because, <laughs> we're, you know, we're very nice. Um, I, I think, you know, it's interesting to me to hear this whole conversation because actually we did this uh, research recently to figure out what would people be likely to do. And what we found is that the success of what we've done so far is 91% of people <coughs> said this is wrong and it shouldn't happen. Um, but only 27% of the people said they were very likely to take action to do something. Um, and the action they were most likely to take now is when they actually see violence in front of them to do something about it. That was the thing they said they would do. And the thing they were afraid of was the consequences to them, both their personal safety and just you know the, the backlash. Um, but all of the other things that we asked them about, like would you speak to the, um, the, would you write a letter to the editor about something offensive that you saw, um, they were very unlikely to do that. Um, and so the real challenge for us as a social movement is to think about what is the barrier that's holding people back if they totally agree, why is the intensity of their willingness to act so low? Um, and part of what we, um, the research shows is that they think that they know it's a huge problem. They don't, they don't even need the data. They believe that it's a problem. They know it. But they kind of have a sense of like, someone must be taking care of it, and they can't imagine what they can do. So the challenge for us really is to figure out what kinds of campaigns like the DWI campaign can we do that will engage people, that they'll be motivated to take action, and that we're helping them with that, the piece that they're missing with. They can't imagine what they personally can do. And I really do think there are very simple, small things, the kinds of stuff that we're talking about here, that is, um, whether it's your letter to the editor or talking to your friend when you see them do something wrong, or you know, everyone who watches the Super Bowl, you could spend your entire commercial breaks at the Super Bowl talking about the offensive mm -hmm. stuff on that. You know, it's like there are things that people can do, and it's on us, really, to um, figure out what is holding them back and what kinds of campaigns will they engage in. And actually, the work that Archie's group is going to be doing in the next two years is really developing some strategies and often creating some possible campaigns, and then we're going to do more research and try to test those. And I think the other thing that we would like to do, and you know, maybe others will do it, 
is to do some, um, there's psychological research you can do to figure out what's holding people back, what are the barriers. Um, so, you know, the more common research is to say, here's a campaign, would you do it? But the other kind of research is to really try to figure out um, what is going on for you that you're hesitant to get involved, what's stopping you? And that kind of psychological research, I think, we have a huge gap in our field, and it would be great to get more of that. Inga, I, oh, sorry, go so ahead. Okay. Um, I was, we're actually running out of time. So I think what I'd like to do, Inga, is ask you, you are a representative of our host country here, <laughs> um, to wrap it up for us, please. Uh, well, I, I just want to say I, I think it was really great to, to listen to all of you and to listen to, to uh, the questions also that you are so committed to this. And I, I would like to not only duplicate you, Ted, but <laughs> mul multi multi <laughs> multiply. Multi we, can, we can clone him. Yeah, clone him, <laughs> <that's the word. laughs> Because it's so great what you've said. It's really, really important. But I would also like to add a very important perspective for me as also a minister for children because children are so much affected by this violence and they live with it constantly and they are so damaged by it they're not just witnesses and they shouldn't be treated like witnesses they are victims and uh, uh, we know a lot of, of the violence is actually happening while uh, the woman is pregnant Often it, it increases during pregnancy. So also the health services, they have to address this explicitly. Uh, and uh, we know now from research, both from, from the US and from Norway, that uh, this violence affects also the brain and development of the brain of the children. And we know that uh, also a lot of these children, they, well, they see that this is the way of handling relationships. Violence is a natural thing. So we have to address it from, from early childhood and from yeah, actually when, when the child is in, in the mother's stomach. So a womb. So I will just like to say thank you. It's been very inspiring. And uh, I have so many ideas I want to, <laughs> to discuss with my uh, colleagues. All right, thank you. I was going to let that be the last word, but Archie, I know you've got something that you want to say, so quick, quick oh, comment. All I wanted to say to the young woman who raised um, her, her friend, her boyfriend and her friend, I just wanted to say there's nothing wrong with being a feminist, first of all. <laughs> so, so, don't be a part of making us look bad. Uh, number two is um, empower the woman. There's no reason to wait for your boyfriend to talk to his male friend. Tell the woman where she can go for help. Don't be scared of how she'll react. She'll thank you for it when she's safe. Mm. All right. Thank you every, yeah, thank very you, much. Thank you. thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. everybody to our wonderful panelists. Um, what I want to say, first of all, is I feel like we just scratched the surface. There's more information um, in the, in the uh, brochures that were on your chairs or in the information that was on your chairs. This conversation will continue on the fourth floor. I want to thank Half the Sky. I want to thank Norway, the, the entire country. Um, <laughs> Inga Marta, Tor, Tor Say it. Thank you. <laughs> I think you're good. You're I, I, well. I was doing so well upstairs. Jackie yeah. Payne from Move to End Violence, Ted Bunch, A Call to Men, Audrey Moore from the DA's office, the Manhattan DA's office, Archie Piatti from the Sanctuary for Families. Thank you. You are all wonderful. I admire every single one of you. We could talk for hours. <laughs> but we will continue this upstairs. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.